With how overwhelming the support was on my last Total Drama video, I feel like it'd be an insult to my viewers if I just kept those styles of videos as a one and done thing, especially when it comes to Total Drama. So with popular demand, here I am with the full story of Total Drama action. If you're somehow finding this video as a first time viewer of mine, I do strongly suggest checking on the original video I did on Total Drama Island about a month ago to get some extra context. But most importantly, I strongly encourage just watching these shows slash seasons of these shows before watching these types of videos if you haven't done so already. The last thing I I want to do is discourage folks from watching the genuine source material and using these videos as a way to feel like you never need to watch the main stuff, if you never have before, that is. But but anyways, let's get into it. The story of Total Drama action pretty much picks up where Total Drama Island ended. The specific set of contestants that were in the lake by the end of that episode were given a chance to compete in another Total Drama season, but this time for $1 million instead of just 100 k with a brand new location to boot. Specifically, an old abandoned film lot with a bunch of different set designs used for mostly movie-related challenges. Whether it be alien, monster, superhero, mysteries, Total Drama Action covered just about every major genre of film there is into its challenges. The first episode, Monster Cash, opens with all the returning contestants getting reacquainted with each other at the new location. Beth, in particular, feeling like a brand new person because not only did she get her braces off, but apparently has a very attractive boyfriend back home named Brady. Chris shows up shortly after and gives everyone a brief tour of the film lot, where after a bit of driving around, he sets up the first challenge, which is running away from a giant animatronic monster that's controlled by Chef while the contestants contestants trying to make it to their trailer shelters. Izzy, or what she likes to call herself from this part of the season, E-Scope, is the first one to get caught by the monster, not even really caring that she lost either because of how much fun she's having. As for some of the others, Gwen, Beth, Trent, and Lindsay decide to follow Justin's path because he seems very confident, while Jeff and Bridget are having an extremely tough time keeping their hands off each other to focus on the challenge. And this ends up biting them in the ass pretty quickly too because the monster gets them next, followed by Lashana and Harold shortly after. Justin gets caught too but is handled with much more care by Chef's monster for because of how pretty he is. I can't say I blame Chef either. Eventually, it comes down to just Owen being left. Chef does try to grab him, but because of how heavy Owen is, even the monster's mechanical arm isn't enough to keep him airborne for too long. Unfortunately for the rest of his friends, they had to wait in their little bounce house prison for 10 hours for Owen to show up because of how slow he walks. But this was only the first part of the challenge, the second challenge being to find a hidden key inside a bunch of foam and wax fake food. However, Owen being the glutton he is becomes so enamored with what he thought was real food, he just eats everything before the true challenge's purpose is revealed. But luckily for him, he burped up the hidden key that needed to be found anyway, allowing them to pick whichever trailer they wanted, which didn't end up really mattering anyway since both got squashed and rebuilt by Chef. Was it really worth it for the bit, Chef, really? <laughs> the next episode, Alien Resurrection, follows the contestants duking it out in an alien movie challenge, specifically finding an alien egg and returning it to a home base before the big alien, once again played by Chef, catches you, with the two fastest players getting to be the team captains for the season and pick who they want for their teams. This is also when the rift between Gwen and Trent's relationship slowly begins to build, starting with how much Gwen and Duncan bonded over alien movies, while Trent felt like the odd man out. And once everyone is inside and wandering about the area, they start hearing some weird noises thinking it's Chef, but everyone seems to be pretty hesitant on whether or not to be the first ones to go towards the noise, so Beth takes it upon herself to take the lead, full of confidence. But in the end, the noises just turned out to be Jeff and Bridget macking on each other again. Soon after, a danger alarm starts going off that gives everyone more of a boost to get moving and splitting up in the process. Jeff and Bridget in particular getting left behind by the bigger groups though because of everyone not wanting to be near the classic trope of the kissing couple getting picked off by the aliens first. And funny enough, it ended up being Harold that was the first one out though, so I guess Duncan's paranoia was a, a bit off this time. We also get another cool sequence of Izzy and Chef fighting together, this time with paintball guns instead of fists, so it was naturally not as cool as their brawl in the first season, but still pretty funny nonetheless. Eventually, it comes down to Duncan, Gwen, and Trent with the eggs of their own. They retrieved from the alien base in the boiler room. However, Chef and Chris catch up to them, with Chris in particular dropping a slime and napalm strike on the three contestants, but only Duncan gets hit, allowing Trent and Gwen to win the challenge and become the team captains for the season. Trent in particular isn't happy about this one bit, because it means he'll have to compete against his girlfriend for the remainder of his time on the show. Later that night is the first elimination ceremony for the season, which is held on a part of the lot that looks like an award show stage, with the safe players receiving awards shaped like Chris, and of course the person or people who don't get to go home in a, you know, kind of cruddy limit. The unlucky contestants this time were both Jeff and Bridget because of everyone finding their constant kissing a liability in challenges. Well, at least they still have each other. Riot on set focuses on the contestants' acting skills, opening with the teams getting selected as Trent's killer grips and Gwen's screaming gaffers, while Trent's mental strength continues to go further and further down the drain because of how close Gwen and Duncan continue to become. His methods aren't the best for handling that, that's for sure, i.e. trying to overcompliment Lindsay and calling Gwen a punk wannabe is not the sharpest tool in the shed 
on that one, is he? And Trent's taunting combined with DJ's lack of motivation to carry equipment wins the killer grips the first part of the challenge. But the main part is actually putting a set together where one person from each team has to act out a scene. Izzy's supposed to act as an old lady while Duncan is a mobster. However, the scripts get mixed up, leading to some pretty out of place yet funny lines between both of their characters they're playing. But thanks to Duncan's incredibly emotional performance, he wins it for the screaming gaffers. All the while, Chef is actually trying to train DJ behind the scenes to become more manly and improve his usefulness in challenges, mainly because he sees a bit of himself in DJ. But Chef will only do this if DJ agrees to split the winnings with him. Later on in the day, Gwen and Trent seem to reconcile a bit with Trent apologizing for calling her a wannabe and acting so jealous. Oh, we'll see how long that lasts. As for the elimination ceremony, it was bye-bye to Izzy Eastcope for failing to clutch the win for her team as the old lady. With Chris trying to make it as clear as possible, she is not allowed to come back under any circumstances. Beach Blanket Bogus opens with the contestants getting some breakfast and Trent once again acting out of pocket. Not with jealousy towards Duncan this time, but being very superstitious about having nine of something, freaking out when Duncan eats one of his nine egg pieces. As for the first part of the challenge, everyone has to stay on a surfboard for a set amount of time without falling off, whilst a bunch of things can be thrown at or used against them to make it harder to stay on. Pretty much everyone other than Duncan gets rolled in this challenge though, so the gaffers take the dub in the first part, with the second part being a sandcastle building contest located at Camp Wawanaqua. Harold puts the gaffers in an incredible spot with his mad architect skills, whereas the grips struggle due to Trent's obsession with the number nine, refusing to finish the castle unless nine of every important thing can fit on there. Gwen begins to pick up on this herself and Duncan thinks he's so obsessed with the number nine because it's what adds up the letters from Gwen and Trent's names. She's a bit freaked out by it for sure, but decides to not pull the trigger on ending the relationship quite yet. As for the sand castles, Beth takes it upon herself to take the lead on reconstructing the castle with sand and paper mache to make it more stable. This combined with the gaffer castle getting ruined by seagulls makes it a tie match, coming down to a dance competition on the beach between Trent and Lashana. Trent could have won, but throws the challenge on purpose to try to get on Gwen's good side again, unbeknownst to Gwen at the time that he even threw on purpose, with the night ending on Justin's true competitive nature coming to light, pretending to get close to Beth if it means he can get further in the competition. Where was this guy last season, man? 310 to Crazy Town is one of the funniest episodes in the season for me, the challenge this time being centered around a western movie, where each contestant has to high dive land on a horse from what has to be at least 100 feet high. Somehow everyone survives this, makes zero sense, but sure. And Trent barely does though. Or maybe they can. <laughs> that line delivery kills me every time. This part ends with a three to three tie, so it goes to the lasso part of the challenge, with the gaffers as the cows and the grips as the cowboy. But Trent is once again throwing for Gwen and hardly puts in an effort to lasso her, even when she literally gives herself up after being cornered, allowing the cow team to turn the tables and lasso the cowboys. Personally, the way Justin got caught was my favorite. Not the face or the neck, hands, feet, legs, knees, or anything in the chest region. With Gwen now realizing Trent has been throwing on purpose, she decides to end things with Trent, something that Justin overhears. So he uses this as a way to not only get rid of Trent for throwing, but to make sure Gwen can be useful to help the grips win challenges if need be. And that's exactly how it goes at Elimination Night. Trent goes out sad without getting a chance to say goodbye to Gwen. The next episode titled Trent's Descent is where a trend of special episodes begin airing every now and then this season. These are the Aftermath specials, a sideshow hosted by Bridget and Jeff that gives some behind the scenes looks at unofficial footage from the show as well as bringing on booted contestants for interviews while the remaining TD contestants that didn't get a chance to compete in action can voice their opinions about what's been going on in the latest episodes as well as give a little bit of an extra context as to why certain contestants acted the way they did during their elimination episodes. But because these episodes don't necessarily progress the plot forwards, I feel like it's not super necessary to go over each one of these individually, I really don't, but rather just give a brief rundown on the more important things that did take place in the aftermath. For instance, Trent's nine of session is revealed to be a sad story related to his grandfather, about how the grandfather gave Trent a toy train when he was little, but right before he died, a train lost a wheel, so it only had nine wheels now, so Trent's mom tried to turn it into a positive thing by making nine his lucky number. Gwen and Trent's uncomfortable reunion, uh, Courtney started to get suspicious of Gwen and Duncan dating, and a uh, electric chair liar challenge, and, you know, I guess, I guess that was fun. The only Aftermath episode that had genuine relevance to the competition's progress was the fourth one, which essentially worked as the season's finale, so... I'll get into the details on that one later. As for the next main episode, The Chef Shank Redemption, this has contestants competing in a prison break movie challenge, starting early too with both the guys and the girls needing to find a way out of their locked trailers, DJ being the only one not locked in because he was on another side quest with Chef training him to be more manly. Eventually, the first main challenge starts with one person from each team being stuck inside a cage and having to eat prison slop, with whoever pukes last winning a golden shovel advantage for the next part. Luckily for the grips, Gwen is one of the people who is tasked with eating something for the gaffers. At 
At first, it looked like Gwen was a shoo in to lose because of DJ sprinkling on his special mama spice on Lindsay's food to make it taste better, but because of Lindsay witnessing Beth put a dirty retainer back in her mouth, she ends up puking first, putting Gwen in another predicament where she has to try to lose. As for Chef, he is not happy with DJ helping Lindsay because he was too prideful about his culinary skills, but a quick pep talk seems to patch things up for the time being between them. As for the second part of the challenge, where the teams have one person push the rest of their teams inside a laundry basket across an obstacle course, Gwen has a solid lead at first until Beth guilt trips her about doing too well, where she stops short and pretends to get a cramp in her leg to give the grips a lead. The final part of the challenge is the nail in the coffin for Gwen, where she breaks a shovel over Harold's head during the digging part of the challenge while pretending to have a panic attack. This doesn't stop DJ from being motivated to win, though. A shout out to Chef's coaching. But before that, Izzy randomly appears underground, claiming to have lived with the Prairie Dogs the entire time, even allowed back into the game on the grips again due to a weird technicality about how she's calling herself Izzy again and Escope was the one voted off. Sure, why not? The gaffers end up losing even with Izzy's help, though. As for Gwen, she was easy pickings to get voted off that night, not only because of how insanely suspicious Heather was of her actions, but hitting Harold over the head with the shovel was enough to get Harold and Lashana to vote for her, too. Crazy to see one of the original final two get off so early in the game this time around. One flew over the cuckoos is all about playing doctor. Chris ends up waking up the remaining contestants up in the middle of the night for a med-school study session with pizza. Pizza made by DJ and Chef. DJ being their main reason it tastes so good, but Chef added a secret ingredient of his own. Plus, due to this challenge being a confirmed reward challenge, the members of the gaffers aren't taking the studying too seriously, prompting Lashana to ask Duncan if he want to be in alliance with her and Harold, to which Duncan laughs off casually. As for the first part of the challenge, each team has to reassemble a fake dead body of Chris and electrify it back to life to win. But the only way a contestant can go for a body part is if they answer a trivia question from one of the med books. It's more or less even for a bit with Duncan messing with Harold during the downtime, because he obviously still has a grudge against him for getting Courtney booted last season. Lashana quickly comes to Harold's defense where she tries to get him to agree to the alliance, but Harold rejects it just like Duncan, only with anger instead of laughter. Both teams are in the home stretch to electrocute their dummies, but everyone starts feeling like they're experiencing symptoms of diseases they read about the night before. Everyone except Duncan and Lashana, who start to do some detective work on why they're not feeling anything just because they didn't study. It just doesn't add up. The two of them find out about Chef's special seasoning for the pizza, which was itching powder mixed with laxatives, and all the other symptoms were just placebo effects from tons of studying slash lack of sleep the night before. The gaffers win by default since both Duncan and Lashana figured everything out, but Lashana in particular got the reward, which was to spend the day at the spa with her cousin. Her team allows this because she fake cried about the stress of the challenge and they bought it. Surely that lie won't come back to bite her in the butt. The Sandwich Project is a horror movie challenge, starting with Chris calling everyone to the northeast corner of the studio Palooza and pretending to be skewered by a set light using tons of different special effects. After explaining how he did it, he sets up the first part of the challenge, a scream off for the loudest scream. Someone on each team plays the role of a killer and has to scare their own teammates as best as they can. The gaffers naturally want Duncan, but Chef intervenes and essentially forces them to use DJ, as sort of a way to prove he's made progress with all the secret training. The grips choose Beth easily too because she literally can't scream due to her throat problems, A big props to Lindsay for standing up for herself and being the one to even suggest Beth in the first place. DJ earns his team an easy point by scaring Harold, but Beth gets her follow-up point by scaring Lindsay, well, sort of, with the final point going to the gaffers thanks to Izzy and Owen being too distracted with each other to get scared by Beth. So Chef was able to just scare DJ, Heather, and Duncan easily. Personally, I think the scariest thing was seeing Duncan and Heather force a kiss. Blech. This is where DJ begins to feel the weight of guilt caused by his alliance with Chef. He feels like he's just getting these free wins now. He wants to tell him it's over, but Chris tells him Chef's in a meeting with the producers for messing with challenges. So they were in on it the whole time, apparently, the producers. They weirdly move on from that point pretty quickly and move on to the next part of the challenge, though, where the gaffers have to try to scare the grips away from the mess hall in secret. Since those guys were forced to stay there for the night for losing the first part of the challenge. Most of the gaffers' efforts are futile thanks to Lindsay, of all people, being the voice of reason and seeing through all their tricks. That is until DJ throws a fork at her ghost detecting device to make it go off as if a real ghost was really there. Although the gaffers won, in a surprising turn of events, DJ removes himself from the competition after the guilt of cheating with Chef became too much to handle, even standing up to Chef in the process. Owen was the saddest of all, though, because that means all the good food will go back to crap now. Unfort. Master of Disasters is pretty self explanatory of what genre they're going for now, disaster movies. Everyone misses DJ's good cooking, but has to suck it up to save face or feel the wrath of Chef Hatchet. As for the first disaster movie challenge, everyone has to run through a dangerous obstacle course while Chef throws random crap at them to make it even more dangerous. Despite being pelted by hail-sized golf balls, none of the injuries the contestants received from this challenge seem to be too serious. That is until Chef threw a giant textbook right at Owen's mouth, completely shattering his teeth and jaw. One of the few injuries in a total drama season that ends up having long 
long-lasting effects, meaning he's still allowed to compete in the competition overall, but had to sit out for the remainder of the challenge to get treatment. As for the second challenge, it follows everyone else trying to escape the inside of a flooding submarine. Both teams have trouble picking the lock for the bottom exit, so they have to wait for the water to get higher for the upper one. But even those were just traps with a shark inside and fire inside the other. And as the water gets higher, Lashana gets worried for her life and Harold tells her not to cry. She claims she never cries though, ever, which ends up exposing her as a fake crier to get the reward with her cousin previously, putting her in a pretty bad spot with Duncan and Heathers in particular. Though thanks to Harold's mad lock picking skills and using a giant straw to breathe underwater, he's able to get his team out of there and indirectly save the other team from drowning too. So Lashana is safe for now and the grips don't have to vote off anyone either, presumably because of Owen's jaw injury. A full metal drama opens with Lashana trying to play nice with her teammates after they found out about her lie, offering her first spot in line for the bathrooms. However, Harold is the only one who's willing to give in on account of his feelings for her. Owen was in there the entire time though because he's having trouble thanks to his new liquid diet. Chef offers him a fiber shake, but he doesn't want it, so Lashana just ends up drinking it since she's barely eaten with DJ gone. As for the challenge this week, it's war movie themed. Lindsay decides to take the lead for her team while it's Duncan takes the lead for his, despite Harold wanting to make it more of a team effort. This continues for most of the remaining challenges too, Harold's idea is constantly getting brushed off as not useful enough. Even after Harold compliments Duncan's efforts on the controlled explosive challenge, Duncan still finds a way to give Harold a hard time. The gaffers easily win that part of the challenge too, thanks to not only Duncan, but Izzy slash Explosivo going overboard on the grip side. The next part follows the winning gaffers needing to defend a trunk of treasure from the invading grips. So their plan is to dig a bunker and camouflage it with grass. The plan seems to work for a bit because the grips, whose plan is to just bum rush the enemy base, did have trouble finding them. That is until Lashana's overdose of fiber begins to give away their position. Duncan's booby trap is able to sell the grips at first, but they eventually come back for round two, where Harold is able to take everyone down with his mad yo-yo skills, only after he got Duncan to admit Harold had value as a teammate, much to Duncan's annoyance. But he did give him genuine props after the fact, so that was nice. As for the grips, it was Izzy who got the boot for failing her teammates in the explosion challenge and for telling Justin he isn't cute. A biggest mistake she made there for sure. <laughs> Ocean's 8 or 9 still has Lashana's teammates on her back about lying, including Harold this time around. I guess infatuation can only get him so far. Plus, unbeknownst to everyone else, both Lashana and Owen get kidnapped by producers for the first part of today's challenge, a bank robbery movie. Owen's jaw is back to normal now though, so that's cool too. Each team has to break their respective teammates out of a safe. Neither teams are having much luck until Beth uses some cologne she had on her that smells like roasted chicken to get Owen's attention. He was so hungry and enamored by the smell that he was able to break open the safe's door with brute force like the Hulk. A little too hungry, one might say. As for the gaffers, they decide to just follow the grips to the next part of the challenge because they don't care about saving Lashana anyway. The gaffers even end up beating the grips to the bank robbery section on account of Owen losing his mind to hunger. But as for the grip side of things, we get the surprise return of Courtney into the game, starting off as pretending to play a bank teller and then being allowed onto the grips team. Her lawyers really did a number on Chris and the producers, huh? The final part of the challenge with the getaway cars ends up being an easy win for the gaffers too, thanks to Duncan's mechanical skills and Owen's hunger hallucinations continuing to hinder his team's progress, to the point where Lindsay and Beth had to rewire his jaw so he'll calm down, meaning Owen was the quickest choice to get booted this time around. Not like this, not like this. One million bucks BC was a weird one because it was one of those reward challenges that didn't feel like it moved the plot forward due to not only a lack of eliminations, but lack of any major character moments. So I'm gonna keep this one short and sweet. It was a caveman movie related challenge that mainly focused on Heather's obsession to steal some of Courtney's hair because she was sick of being bald, which nobody even cares to defend her for since nobody likes how Courtney's getting all this special treatment on account of her getting back into the game through legal gymnastics, like her having her own special sleeping arrangements and such. So she just becomes super ruthless as a result, even showing no mercy against her supposed lover, Duncan. And that's just the weird thing about total drama action and to an extent the next season to come. And despite the total number of contestants being a lot smaller than the original cast amount, the season still went on for the same amount of episodes as the original season did. Hence why things like the aftermath specials and a bunch of these no elimination or high stakes episodes existed. So the slots could still be filled. The episode was still relatively a fun watch though. Million Dollar Babies on the other hand, definitely had stakes. Sports movies were always a big hit or miss for me in real life, but Total Drama did it pretty well, I think. The first sport everyone tackles is football, which technically wasn't part of the actual challenge, but rather an assessment to see who'd fight in one-on-one -on -one matches to come, starting with Harold versus Lindsay in marshmallow boxing, ending with Harold getting knocked cold, but winning anyway for doing amazing slow motion acting throughout the entire fight. Beth and Heather duke it out in badminton for the second challenge, where Beth goes full anger mode and wins due to all the taunting from the other gaffer members. What set her off the most was Lashana's jab about her boyfriend not being real. But the other reason was Beth found out Lashana talked shit about everyone while she was on the spa trip thanks to accidentally seeing the TD website through Courtney's PDA. 
Courtney plays everything Lashana said, and once again, nobody is on her side. Even people from the opposing team aren't messing with her like that right now, which is also a bad thing with the team merge getting so close. As for the third challenge, Duncan and Courtney have to wrestle each other in a booby-trapped ball pit, where Duncan goes out sap, ending the main challenge with a slam dunk competition between Justin and Lashana. Lashana wins this, which forces a surprise tiebreaker cheerleading competition, where Lashana wins again after constructing an apology cheer, which gets everyone on her good side again. But it was all for naught in terms of the competition because the Grips did a cheer dedicated to Chris, and nothing can beat Chris's love for himself. If it wasn't for that cheer, Lashana definitely would have went home because it was enough to convince Harold and Duncan, resulting in Heather getting the boot. At least she went out on semi-good terms with Lashana. Dial M for Merger falls into a similar category to the Caveman episode, but at least this one did have the teams finally merging into one. The contestants were taking place in a spy movie challenge this time around, with Courtney in particular really falling into her role as the season's main antagonist. I'm striking a deal with all the remaining contestants to split the money with her 50-50 if she doesn't win so they won't potentially die from an explosion. Plus, Lashana is finally able to get Harold and Duncan to agree to a truce, at least for the time being. Clearly, they still have some issues to work out, but things have undoubtedly improved between them since the start of the season. And nobody got eliminated, obviously, but none of them were really winners that day when the stunk bomb explosion sprayed everyone in the final part of the challenge, forcing everyone to bathe in tomato juice to lose the stench. They were able to get Courtney to call off her bogus deal, too, so she wouldn't have to smell like scar alone, and what should have been a reward with her and Lindsay getting to tour a cheese factory, but Courtney doesn't really like Lindsay as much as the rest of us do, unfortunately. Super Herald has the guys on the edge later that night, and mainly Justin due to them being outnumbered three to four by the girls, so he wants to devise some kind of plan to make sure they won't be easy pickings for them. The next morning, Chris calls everyone to the superhero lot for their superhero challenge, where everyone has to come up with their own superhero costume, name, and powers. Despite having the least original costume there, Lindsay wins the first part as Wonder Woman due to Chris being such a big fan as a kid. As for the second part, Harold seems to be doing the best as Captain Alberta until Courtney, the human cricket, beats his obstacle run by about five seconds. With the challenge now over and Courtney having invincibility, things do get tricky for Harold because the girls want Duncan gone, but the guys want Lashana gone. But thanks to Courtney's manipulation skills, she's able to convince Harold to actually vote off Lashana, where she once again loses her shot at the big prize, but at least her elimination this time around was a lot more fair in the context of the show. The prince Princess Pride opens with Justin trying to get on Courtney's good side in the worst way possible, followed by Chef and Chris coming in dressed in medieval garb to announce the fairy tale movie challenge. And whoever's foot can fit in the glass boot gets to be the princess for the day, who ends up being Courtney after she jams her entire foot in there barely. The first part of the challenge has everyone playing fairy tale dress up and blindfolded to cross a troll bridge. Harold, Justin, and Duncan are able to make it across, allowing Lindsay and Beth to sit out for the rest of the challenge, although they're, you know, very injured. When the other boys get a glimpse of Courtney's princess Tire, both Justin and Duncan just fall immediately in love with her. You gotta respect Justin, you know, standing up to Duncan of all people, especially when it comes to Courtney's affection. The two of them eventually get into it physically for a bit in the final part of the challenge to rescue Courtney from a dragon. So Justin decides to buddy up to Harold since he'd have no problem going against Duncan too, and you know, just to make things easier. Harold wasn't too thrilled with the end result though, because Justin did say he was gonna let Harold get to the top first, which didn't happen. Justin almost gets his desired kiss from Courtney too, until Chris throws them a curveball, saying the two of them must sword fight for invincibility. Courtney, of course, had no problem letting Justin fall at the tower if it meant getting closer to the million. And man, that guy really couldn't catch a break from injuries in this episode, huh? But the worst blow of all was getting voted off and nobody seeming to care that he was leaving either. It's harsh. Get a Clue starts the morning with Harold eating one of Chef's breakfast tacos, only to find a flash drive inside. So Duncan takes it upon himself to stick it in Courtney's PDA to see if it's related to the challenge. A message from Chris then subtly reveals that the challenge will be mystery movie themed. With the other clues in his message hinting at him being trapped in one of the same safes Owen and Lashana were trapped in a few episodes back. So everyone heads over there and finds him locked in there. Once he's out of there, he says the next part of the challenge involves each player trying to gather fingerprint and DNA samples from the others, by any means necessary. Some try to act sneaky, while others just use brute force. Lindsay was the only one who couldn't get any prints, which kind of sucked for her, so she had to just deal with what she could. The final stretch of the challenge is to solve the mystery of Chris's fake murder on the train. Courtney attempts to be the voice of reason, but the rest start to believe Chris is 
actually dead, with Duncan being the first prime suspect, with one of his green hairs being found where Chris's fake body was. But after Lindsay noticed fingerprints that looked a lot like Courtney's, she was the next suspect and the person Chris had as the murderer. Granted, she wasn't in on it. This was a really nice moment for Lindsay too, because her sense of judgment wasn't being taken seriously for the entire episode up until this point, so seeing her get a win like this, essentially by herself, was awesome. As for her reward, she got to spend a night out at the movies and took Duncan with her, and she probably would have taken Beth normally, but she felt bad that Duncan was accused of the murder wrongly, so she wanted to make it up to him. Rock and Rule fittingly opens with Lindsay singing, though it appears the other contestants are having trouble appreciating how good she sounds. This is followed by Chef getting everyone else's attention by busting out a killer drum solo, and Chris tells everyone today's genre is the rock and roll biopic on top of revealing that Owen is back in the competition. Chris struck a deal with Owen to come back because his family was struggling after his mother blew 50 grand, but the catch is he has to try to stir the pot amongst the alliances to amp up the drama in total drama without getting caught. Duncan takes the first dub in the Guitar Hero-esque challenge, while Lindsay, Duncan, and Courtney nail the paparazzi section too. It all comes down to who can trash a fake hotel room the best, which Courtney nails because of how mad she was with Lindsay doing well in the previous part. So with Courtney having invincibility, it ended up being Lindsay that went home that night, mainly because she accidentally voted herself out and put the odds against her. Definitely the most disappointing elimination this season, as she deserved to at least see the final four in my opinion. Crouching Courtney, Hidden Owen is definitely another one of my personal favorites. We open with the remaining contestants being taken to Camp Wawanaqua while they sleep. Soon after, Chris shows up in a gi announcing this kung fu movie challenge will be boys versus girls. So for once, Duncan actually tries to do Harold a favor by allowing him to be the fighter of the pair, attempting to train him along the way. As for the girls, it's Beth who's the fighter. Owen ends up sitting out completely due to the deal he has with Chris, so he spends the entire time trying to take notes on who'd be the easier team to sabotage. Courtney's plan to train Beth involves more of a suck up in hopes of winning Beth over for an alliance, but Beth knows better after all the BS she dealt with when it came to Heather last season. And in classic Total Drama fashion, Chris reveals all the training they did was for nothing, because the actual fight was done in giant robot suits with the chosen fighters inside, and the other teammates remote controlling them. Owen, on the other hand, tries to give the guys the upper hand at first, but ends up being sweet-talked into giving the girls advice too, which kind of negates the plan for his sabotage at the moment. Harold and Duncan clutch the win in the fight, completely destroying Beth's suit in the process, resulting in the guys now having to compete against each other by carrying a glass of water to the top of the cliff where they did their first challenge last season. And they can't spill too much water either because they gotta brew some tea at the top, while the girls are stuck doing dishes and making food at the old mess hall. On their way up the mountain, Harold and Duncan start to bond a bit over their first victory despite Owen trying to drive a wedge between their alliance. And Beth isn't opposed to playing some mind games on Courtney either, making Courtney do most of the punishment dirty work under the illusion she'll finally agree to an alliance with Courtney. As a last ditch effort to break them up, Owen is able to get Duncan to talk bad about Lashana, which sets Harold over the edge to punch Duncan in the face and spill his water, earning Harold the overall win for the day, and Beth and Courtney finally agreeing to an alliance with each other, only each of them still think they're playing the other. 2008 A Space Owen opens with Chris waking everyone up in the middle of the night to announce their space-themed movie challenge. Before the challenge begins though, everyone is given an item from the outside by a loved one. Owen in particular starts to feel guilty about his role in the game again after receiving a trophy for being an honest student back home, so I can't blame him there. As for the first challenge, it involves toughing it out in a zero-gravity space shuttle. Eventually, an alarm goes off when they're inside, which can only be stopped by a specific lever. Harold is able to fix this, but Owen ends up throwing the nunchucks he got from his family out the window as another form of sabotage. But as a way of getting some indirect revenge despite not knowing what he did, they just use Owen's body to block the window he shattered. As for the second challenge, everyone has to survive in a ride known as the Vomit Comet. Beth ends up taking the dub on this despite Courtney wanting Beth to refuse to do it with her being part of the, you know, girl alliance and all. And before the elimination ceremony, Harold calls out Owen for his traitorous behavior, being the only one to figure it out. Though Owen denies it for the time being. As for who got voted off, it ended up being Harold. At least he went out with some extra revenge on Duncan. Top Dog begins with a very tired Duncan in a bitter mood after a long talk with Courtney the night before. He's got to memorize a bunch of stuff if he wants to stay in a relationship with her again. We then cut to the mess hall where Chris announces the challenge for the day, the Animal Buddy movie, with each person needing to tame an animal laid out for them. Duncan gets a chameleon, Courtney gets a shark, Owen gets a bear, and Beth by default gets a raccoon. Before Owen does any training though, he goes back to sabotaging, like spray painting Duncan's hair to mess with the chameleon's perception of color and dripping his own blood into the shark tank to screw with Courtney. Beth ends up taking the W here since she was able to get the raccoon to mimic everything she does without even trying too hard, with the second part having everyone find their way back to the film lot through a 10 mile woods hike with their animal buddies. This mostly consists of Owen and his bear friend messing with the others thanks to Chris giving him a GPS set to the lost location. And Beth ends up taking the win though with a guarantee to the final three, or technically the final two, since Duncan called it quits with Courtney for the time being with her whole agreement being
being overkill, and Owen getting fired for being found out as the producer's mole, leaving Beth and Duncan as the final two. Despite being the final two contestants, the episode Mutiny on Soundstage was not the official finale for the competition. The first half starts off with the two competing in a pirate-themed movie challenge. Duncan ends up having the lead for the majority of the pirate challenge until the end two, which segues into a treasure hunt gauntlet through each of the previous main challenges, but if they enter a trivia question correctly, they can just skip on to the next stage without having to deal with anything physical. And despite Duncan having the lead, he keeps failing at every single trivia question while Beth keeps nailing them, allowing her to catch up fairly quickly. Towards the end, it comes down to a trivia question about Courtney, which they both fail at, though in Duncan's defense, how could he have possibly known what color she was currently thinking of? So they go through the disaster movie gauntlet as their final obstacle, even helping each other out on the way and being on the best terms they've been in in the entire series so far. The final stretch leads to the same studio where the Aftermath specials are being filmed, though the two of them end up on the stage at the exact same time, forcing the two of them to do even more challenges to break the tie. But before that, they decide to sew some behind-the-scenes clips of Chris acting like a complete degenerate, which bothers him to the point of canceling he and Chef's vacation for the season being over and heading back to the film lot to defend himself. The first tiebreaker is to contort their bodies through various weird moving shapes. This also ends at a tie, and Chris is able to arrive on the scene to take over the hosting from Jeff and Bridget, where he decides it will end up being the remaining contestants in the peanut gallery to vote on who they believe deserves to win it all. But not before Chris shows them a bunch of never-before-seen footage of both of them acting what the others thought was kind of out of character, like Duncan being super nice or Beth being a bit selfish in a way to sway the votes and cause drama. We also have the contestants asking their own specific questions to the finalists, like how they'll use the money if they win, or requesting them to draw a made-up animal. Shout out to Harold for that one. After the votes are cast and read, and depending on which version of the ending you watch, Beth and Duncan get their respective endings as winners, where it's revealed that Beth's boyfriend was indeed real, and Courtney and Duncan are back together again. Uh, for now. Just like last season, Action also has its own epilogue episode. Total Drama Action has been nominated at an award show called The Jemmies, where every contestant from both seasons get to attend, and we also get to see what they've been up to in the downtime from the finale till the award show. Like Heather's hair growing back, Lindsay getting arrested, and DJ getting his own cooking show with his mom, just to name some examples. Apparently their food was so good that people uh, died. Uh, that's kind of crazy and uh, dark at the same time, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but I think my personal favorite fad these guys did was the boy band formed amongst Justin, Trent, Harold, and Cody called the Drama Brothers. A shame they couldn't work it out to stay together. Really unfortunate. This is also where the series first introduces super fan Sierra as someone running a Total Drama fan site for an interview as well as permission to be on the red carpet. But unfortunately for the original TD cast, Chef denies them at the award show door for not being famous enough, where they have to watch the cast of Chris's new show called Turtle Drama Dirtbags walk in. This is also where we're introduced to Alejandro for the first time, the main face of the new version of this Total Drama. To add even more salt to the wound, they end up losing the Jemmy for Best Reality TV Ensemble. After feeling defeated and ashamed, Sierra gives everyone a motivational speech to not give up their shots at being famous again. So they hatch a plan to sabotage the Dirtbag Showcast by driving to the main network location in New York. Eventually, they catch up with them on the road and start trying to crash into their bus, like slingshotting chocolate onto their windshield and shit. This works, but the problem is Courtney is the one driving and gets distracted behind the wheel, kissing Duncan. So their bus ends up falling off a cliff and crashing in a safer manner than normal thanks to the quote-unquote slingshot that was stalled in the back of the bus. Now that they're stranded, Jeff and some of the other contestants like Trent, Justin, Beth, Katie, and Sadie go with him while the others stay behind. But while those guys are out, Chris comes to rescue the ones who stay behind in a helicopter, where he takes them back to the TD action lot and reveals the dirtbag show was all a ruse, used as a way for Chris to test everyone if they still had the will to be in show business, allowing all the rescued contestants, including Sierra and Alejandro, to compete in the next season, Total Drama World Tour, a giant race around the world.